Good morning. My name is Paul Anthony Ritaco. I'm co-chair of the men's club with Clem Rice, who's fending off people on the porch, okay, who want to be in here. Welcome to you all. Men's club has no board of directors, no meetings, no dues, consequently, no revenue. <laughs> we have baskets near the end, uh, outside in the vestibule, for a free will offering if you so choose. It's up to you. Uh, we use that to pay for coffee and for brochures and things of that nature. The balance we give to the Methodist House for the use of this facility. After we pay for the condominium in Guayaquil. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in the back, there's a yellow trifold thing that uh, tells us what we did this year. I have just one announcement. Next week, Jazz Week, I will be doing something from this podium about the greatest photograph ever taken in jazz. And it will be a video as well as some commentary and some discussion about the players, et cetera, et cetera. It's, it's worth your while. We begin at 9 next week and maybe earlier if we fill up. It's not going to be like this. Time. Without further ado, you read the thing in the uh, daily, which is pretty exhaustive and you know, illustrative. Uh, I want to, what we're going to do, here's the format. Victoria Tunsing is going to speak first about the Mueller report, and then she will finish, and Joe will come up and do uh, to want to Spygate one year later. Okay? And we'll do that. Victoria is an attorney, former Deputy Assistant Attorney General of the Criminal Division of the U.S. Department of Justice. Joe is an attorney and former U.S. Attorney for the District of Columbia. They have represented many, many high level people throughout their careers in the D.C. area. Without further ado, here is Victoria Tunsey. Thank you. Whenever Joe and I are asked to speak together, we, we're always asked, of course, well, what order do you want to speak in? And we always say, age before beauty. <laughs> I'm a little bit older. <laughs> um, it's really great to be back with the men's club because last year, you remember, Joe told you, no collusion, right? We speak the truth here. So I'm going to talk to you about uh, the Mueller report, and, and probably the best way to do it is through his testimony, because many of you saw it, and you know that kind of live through and remember as I talk to you about it. And, and as you recall, last month, the Ra Rachel Maddows of this world were just breathless because Mueller was going to testify, and he was going to bring to life, it was going to be the movie version of the special counsel's report. And what did we get? We got a cadaverous <laughs> presentation <laughs> by a man who hardly knew what he was talking about. Over seven hours, he had to say over 30 times, could you repeat the question? He said over 200 times, I don't know or, are you ready? Not in my purview. I wonder how many Googles there were for the word purview. <laughs> In the afternoon before the House Intelligence Committee, he had to take back what he had said in the morning before the Judiciary Committee. Now, th it's, this is an important factor. Uh, Ted Liu from Texas had asked him very specifically, you did not indict Donald Trump because of an OLC opinion. You cannot indict a sitting president, correct? OLC is the Office of Legal Counsel, and it is really the law firm for the whole federal government. So there's an OLC, or two, actually, OLC opinions that say a sitting president cannot be indicted. Mueller was rarely emphatic throughout all his testimony, as I'm sure you all recall, but he looked up at Lou and said, that is correct. And the Democrats were thrilled because, hey, they had, they had the evidence to indict, and they didn't, be only because of this OLC opinion. But now it's the afternoon. And Bob Mueller had to come in, and the first thing he had to say was, um, I, just, I just want to clarify, OK? Let me see. What if I bring this? You won't. You have to take it out of there. I have to lean. I'm leaning right. <laughs> but well, it's, then it's difficult for me to move my papers, OK? See? 
He said, Bob Mueller said, I will speak louder, there was no one reason because we never made a decision whether to indict. Now that is really, I mean, talk about a cop-out. He copped out in what his responsibility was, but that was a really important legal nuance, whether you had the evidence to indict and didn't do it because of OLC, or you never reached that conclusion because you knew you could not indict. And that just happened to comport with what Bill Barr had been saying when he described his conversation with Bob Miller and all the Democrats and the press said he was lying, but he was not. Mueller managed to get in a few false statements in his testimony. Let's start with the one where um, he was asked, were you were friends with Bob Mueller, with uh, Jim Comey, weren't you? And Mueller said, well, we were business associates. Then when pressed by Louis Goldmark, he admitted that they were friends. Everyone knew they were friends. Bill Barr said, I'm friends with Bob Mueller. We're all friends. We all know each other. We travel in the same circles. We do the cases together, for God's sake. But this is really important about whether Mueller was a friend of Comey's because, if you recall, it was the firing of Comey that triggered the special counsel. McCabe said, oh, that's when we started talking about special counsel. McCabe's not a lawyer. I guess he doesn't know that the president exercising his Article II authority that he can hire and fire anybody is not a crime. Rod Rosenstein even knew it wasn't a crime because when he wrote the authorization to appoint Mueller, he didn't put it in the line that said, you are to investigate X. He didn't say the firing of James Comey. He said any link between the Trump campaign and the Russian government, for God's sake, that's embarrassing legally. That means that Sam Clovis, the client of mine, who was the head of the Trump campaign for Iowa, but he's a farmer, if he had sold grain to Russia, could have been investigated under the wording that Rod Rosenstein put into the authorization. So think about it. From the beginning, it, oh, by the way, the Attorney General's regulations for appointing a special counsel say that when there is criminal conduct to be investigated. And so Rod Rosenstein's language did not describe a crime, only a counterintelligence issue. So from the get-go, there was no valid legal reason to appoint a special counsel. And then they make the guy ahead of it whose best friends with the guy who caused it. But let's talk about some of uh, Mueller's other false statements. He said he didn't have to subpoena the president because, well, it would be, be litigated and it would take a long time. No, he would have lost. Here's the legal standard for getting information from the president. There has to be a criminal trial and the material sought, here Donald Trump's testimony, has to be re materially relevant to the issues in that trial. No, no indictment, no crime, so there wasn't going to be any testimony. Oh, Mueller said he wasn't feel familiar with Fusion GPS. Is there anybody in this room that's not familiar with Fusion GPS? And yeah, anyone? I can, there's not one hand, let me just tell you. So he said, well, when pressed, it was not in my purview. All right, so it was in his purview to investigate the Trump Tower meeting of June 2016, where Don Jr. And, and Jared Kushner and Paul Manafort all stupidly went to a meeting to get dirt from a Russian lawyer to get dirt on Hillary. That's not a crime, for goodness sake. But um, he looked at it every way come Sunday. In fact, Paul Manafort was dragged out of and then thrown back into solitary confinement nine times over several months. And each time, Andrew Wiseman, who I'll get to later, would say, now are you going to tell us the president knew about the Trump Tower meeting beforehand? Which would not have, I mean, you know. Now are you going to tell us the president had a jelly donut? That's the legal equivalent. So, <laughs> but it was not in his purview. It was not in Mueller's purview to find out why that Russian lawyer met the day before the Trump Tower meeting and the day after 
the Trump Tower meeting with Glenn Simpson, who is one of the owners of Fusion GPS. That would get my attention right away. He became indignant, Mueller did, when people criticized the partisanship of his staff. And he huffed, I don't ask, I don't ask people their political affiliations. Well, there's not one Republican on the special counsel's team. And every law firm knows that you have to ask about conflicts. This was a political investigation. They were investigating the Trump political campaign, for God's sake. How could this not be political? Oh, if a law firm, for example, represents Aetna and another partner wants to come in with another insurance company, the law firm looks at it. That's the responsibility because even the perception of unfairness is wrong <laughs> in what we do and certainly in prosecutions. Bob Mueller just didn't know that Jenny Rhee had represented the, the Clinton Foundation and Hillary herself personally, and he was her law partner at Wilmer Hill. <laughs> oh my, and he didn't know that Adam Zebley, also his law partner, represented the dude who trashed Hillary's blackberries with a hammer. Both of them are on the team. Now I'm gonna to get to the worst of all, Andrew Wiseman. <laughs> He had attended the Hillary victory party the night of the election. He emailed Sally Yates that he was in awe of her when she refused to obey the president's travel ban. And he did the Enron, Arthur Anderson Enron case where the Supreme Court, nine zip, nine zip, overturned it saying he had created a crime where none existed. It was all right, he brought down. He brought down the, uh, the a whole company of Arthur Anderson. These were the people that were on his team. Got it. <laughs> we're each gonna speak for about 12 minutes and then do questions and answers because that's much more fun. I have one other thing to though, tell you about in the, uh, in the report, so just to show you how dishonest it was. Carter Page, you all know that name. In the report it says, Carter Page lived for five years in Russia, and then he came back to the United States where he was friends with two Russian intelligence agents, one who was convicted for espionage, period. He doesn't tell you that Carter Page helped the FBI get the evidence to prosecute the spy. That, he didn't tell you that Carter Page helped the FBI prosecute the spy. Now, that's the kind of stuff that they left out and how dishonest the report is. And I will let my beautiful husband <laughs> carry it on. Nice to be back, especially under these circumstances, because everything we told you last year is true. <laughs> and it did come true. Last year, we. Last year, we talked about what Victoria and I called a brazen plot to exonerate Hillary Clinton illegally, and then, if she lost the election, to frame Donald Trump. All of that happened, and now it's all been confirmed. And anybody who says it hasn't is simply delusional. Now, this has all been confirmed by Senate reports, House reports, finally some independent reporting by news organizations. But the piece de resistance of it all is a new book that just came out called Ball of Collusion by Andrew McCarthy. I suggest that you buy it, you read it, you give it to friends, have them read it. Andrew McCarthy is the former senior assistant U.S. attorney from the Southern District of New York. He's a widely regarded legal commentator and scholar. He writes for National Review. He was a doubter. He didn't believe that Comey could do what he was accused of doing. He didn't believe that the senior Obama Justice Department and FBI officials could do what they uh, were accused of doing. He couldn't believe that the CIA would do under John Brennan what it was accused of doing. After much digging and listening, he has concluded the exact opposite. And in the book, he describes in great deal what I, detail, and Victoria and I have spoken with Andy over the year and take some 
credit for his conversion, uh, thankfully not a deathbed conversion, but a conversion nonetheless. And let me read for you a little bit of what his book says. The real collusion in the 2016 election was not between the Trump campaign and the Kremlin. It was between the Clinton campaign and the Obama administration. The media Democrat collusion narrative, which paints Donald Trump as a cat's paw of Russia, is a studiously crafted illusion. Despite Clinton's commanding lead in the polls, hyperpartisan intelligence officials decided they needed an insurance policy against a Trump presidency. Thus was born the collusion narrative, built on an anonymously sourced dossier, secretly underwritten by the Clinton campaign and compiled by a former British spy. Though acknowledged to be salacious and unverified at the FBI's highest level, the dossier was used to build a counterintelligence investigation, which Victoria alluded to earlier, against Trump's campaign. Miraculously, Trump won anyway. But his political <clears throat> opponents refused to accept the voters' decision. Their collusion narrative was now peddled relentlessly by political operatives, intelligence agents, Justice Department officials and media ideologues, the vanguard of the Trump resistance. Through secret surveillance, high-level intelligence leaking, and tireless news coverage, the public was led to believe that Trump conspired with Russia to steal the election. Indeed, subsequently, as it evolved, Trump was called a traitor by not only people in the media, but people on Capitol Hill and former Obama administration officials, some of whom I suspect will face some consequences in the next few months. Not one to sit passively through an onslaught, President Trump fought back in his tumultuous way. Matters came to a head when he fired the FBI director, who had given explosive House testimony suggesting the president was a criminal suspect despite privately assuring Trump that he was not. The resulting firestorm of partisan protest cowed the Justice Department, read Rod Rosenstein, the whimpering, simpering little charlatan, <laughs> to appoint a special counsel Amen. whose seemingly limitless investigation bedeviled the administration for two years. Just, put, just remember, they stole two years of an elected president's term to distract him. Just put that in your craw and keep it there for a while. It's, that's part of the favor bank, believe me. That's part of the favor bank. Yet as months passed, concrete evidence of collusion failed to materialize. Was the collusion narrative an elaborate fraud? And if so, choreographed by whom? Against media Democrat caterwauling, a doughty group of lawmakers <laughs> forced a shift in the spotlight from Trump to his investigators and accusers. This has exposed the depth of politicization within American law enforcement and intelligence agencies, and it is now clear that the institutions on which our nation depends for objective policing and clear-eyed analysis injected themselves scandalously into the divisive politics of the 2016 election. Now, read the book. It's, it is a fabulous, <laughs> fabulous read. Here's, it's called Ball of Collusion, B-A-L-L, -L, like, you know, monster ball, all that stuff. Now, here's some things you just need to remember. The issue, I mean, how does this go on and nobody at the upper echelons of the Obama administration knows anything about it? Well, of course they did. On January the 5th, 2017, remember, that's after the election, the interregnum is almost over, we're 15 days from the inauguration, there is a meeting in the Oval Office between President Obama, Vice President Biden, John Brennan, the CIA director, Sally Yates, the Deputy Attorney General, Susan Rice, Ben Rhodes, James Clapper, and others. What did they discuss? Well, we wouldn't know except for one thing, on January the 20th, Inauguration Day, Susan Rice wrote an email to herself and put it in the official 
White House computer that was hers. Now, why did she do this? And let me tell you what's in that email. She said, we had this meeting, and she lists all these people, and he says, we were there to discuss because the president wanted to make sure that all the counterintelligence investigation that had, be, had been done about the Trump campaign was by the book. And whatever intelligence and law enforcement officials had done had been done by the book. And then they go on and talk about how they were going to, they, they had instructed intelligence and law enforcement entities, remember, this is about a new president coming into office, that they might have to make decisions after the Obama people left the White House on January 20th, what information they were going to share with the president and his staff. They were suggesting that a new president should be denied intelligence information because they weren't sure he wasn't a Russian agent, for which there was no evidence. Now, why did they put that in writing? Because she was supposed to win, and nobody was ever supposed to find out what they had done. But she lost. And when she lost, you needed a cover-up plan. You needed an insurance policy. And the insurance policy was to investigate the president to a fairly well after he was sworn in and then impeach him. This is the greatest political, legal intelligence scandal in the history of this country. And President Obama knew about it, authorized it, condoned it, and didn't stop it. And that is the core of this. Now, those who suggest that that is not the case cannot read. I remember there was a gentleman last year who came up to me. You remember the, 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 uh, a gentleman came up and gave a little speech and criticized me for being too sarcastic and laughing too much about people. God forbid anybody should ever laugh. That person, and I said to him, are you, do you read? Are you capable of reading? Do you understand what's out there? In a, read, you can go online, Google Susan Rice, email for the record, January 20th, 2017. Just Google it. Read that email. It'll make your stomach turn. It's like something out of a Russian novel. It is a conspiracy of such depth and such venality and such evil, and such presumption, and such arrogance that you won't believe it. And so if she hadn't written that email, God only knows how long it would take us to figure out that all of the things that had been said about Brennan and Clapper and Comey and Yates was true. This memorializes in writing from one of the co-conspirators the plan, the execution, and then the next steps. Nobody in their right mind would ever put something like that in writing unless they feared disclosure. They needed a trope. They needed an explanation. They needed a patina. They needed something to explain their guile and their perfidy. So read that, read the book, and then just watch over the next few months. Because John Durham, who is the counsel, the US attorney in Connecticut that Bill Barr has appointed to investigate Brennan, Clapper, Comey, all these people, is going to get to the bottom of this. He's interviewed 60 people thus far. There is a grand jury underway. Now, even though James Comey got a pass on the leaks to the New York Times about his memos, that doesn't make Listen, you don't start a case like this with a lousy case. That was a lousy case, because it, it had complications on uh, classification. But Comey is the subject, along with a number of other people, of a criminal conspiracy case being in investigated by John Durham. It is important. Now, you know what? If John Durham determines there's insufficient evidence for an indictment of Comey and Clapper and Brennan, and, uh, that's fine with me. All I want is legitimate investigation, accountability, and then I want it all put on the record. I want to know everything that everybody did. I want to know every everything that Sally Yates did. James Comey, Clapper, Brennan. We know a lot what Clapper and Brennan did. And also, we need to find out, which is now underway, 
an investigation into what Brennan did with overseas intelligence services. For example, it is known that he asked the British to do electronic spying on Americans overseas. We know that Joseph Mifsud and Stefan Halper were wired. They wore wires when they spoke with George Papadopoulos and Carter Page. We know now as a result of leaks from the FBI and from the House Intelligence Committee that those recordings which were made of Papadopoulos and Carter Page reveal that both of the men refused to cooperate in an effort with the Russians. Indeed, Papadopoulos said, that would be treason. Wow, and guess who wasn't told that? The FISA court, against whom they got a warrant against Carter Page. When I say this is the greatest political scandal in history and legal and intelligence scandal, I mean it. This is evil beyond belief. These people appointed themselves as the arbiter of sh who should have won the election, and when their candidate didn't win, they decided they were going to, quote, get the guy who did win. That's not, this is not a banana republic. No matter what you think of Donald Trump and the way he comports himself, he got elected. It's our system. This is what the Dems and the Libs do. When they, okay, we're all going to play by the rules. Remember, they all agree to that. When it's over and they lose, the rules were bad, you violated them, so that means we need to change the rules. No presumption of innocence, no due process, let's get rid of the Electoral College, let's expand the Supreme Court to 25 people who look like Ruth Bader Ginsburg, whatever it is that they want. Whatever it is that they want. So what you have is, you have an uncompromising group of perfidious people on the other side. This is going to be a civil war. We're already there. We talked about this a little bit last year. We're there. And so now what's going to happen? And thank God for Bill Barr. And if, if, if he weren't there, none of this would be occurring. He's a great man. He's a phenomenal lawyer. And he cares deeply about this country. He loves the Justice Department. And I'm convinced when this is over, we're going to know the full story. We have, a, we have a microphone on the side for your questions. Please come up. And uh, I'm here to announce that th we have already confirmed with Victoria and Joe that they will be here in the men's club next week eight of the 2020 season. The topic of Not which- here. No, we want a bigger We, we, want, we a big, want a bigger boat. And, <laughs> we, we want a bigger boat and we're relying on you to make it happen. And you go up to that building <clears throat> at the end of Bester Plaza and you say, we need a bigger spot for this. I tried desperately to get something bigger. I was stonewalled all the way around, okay? But they're gonna be here next year uh, on week eight, which has the ignominious title of reframing the Constitution, okay? So we welcome that. Uh, anybody has questions? I welcome you to step up. Come on, guys. Don't be afraid. <laughs> we cleared everything up. <laughs> okay. Go to the, go to, please go to the mic. Yeah. Right over there. Oh, I didn't What's going to happen with that? I'm concerned about the, I understand, $250 million Clinton Foundation uh, in Canada, and that somehow we're not able to touch the criminality of that. Well, I, I don't want to get into the Clinton Foundation stuff. That's really pretty far afield from what we're here to talk about. But let me just say this. There are a number of fine forensic uh, accountants and journalists working on the Clinton Foundation. There's a gentleman named Charles Ortel, O-R-T-E-L, Charles Ortel. If you care about the Clinton Foundation, go on his website, Charles Ortel. Got you it. will have so much material that will make you feel good about where we're headed on this that you won't Great. worry anymore. Well, Thank let you. me add that I represent uh, William Campbell. Do you know who that is? The FBI undercover informant. Uh, and it, Uranium, Uranium One. One is all, you know, f flowing into that um, Clinton Foundation. Right. And 
I'm very happy to say there's going to be a book out next summer about it all. We just inked the book contract. Thank you. So look forward to that. Yeah, don't worry about the details on all of that. It's all going to come out. It's being worked on now by some very good people. Yes, ma'am. Uh, yes. Um, I was wondering, uh, and I've seen y'all for several years, and I, I'm honored to have y'all here, um, but I was wondering if I do not like the Clintons so much, and most people here know that. I, I <laughs> fear them. I'm from Texas. I've known what they did in Arkansas. Are any of these people, uh, like Comey, like Mueller, are any of them so tied in and so fearful of them that they would do these horrendous things um, because there's a lot of people that died early associated uh, with the Clintons. Yeah. Uh, is there any way that could be it and they have to do it to protect their families or are they just as bad as the Clintons? <laughs> now, let me, let me just tell you something. I, I certainly understand your reasons for suspicion because you know facts sometimes get awfully ugly. But here's, here's, here's the thing. People like Comey and Mueller and Yates and Brennan and Clapper, while they all loved Hillary and wanted her to win, and they knew that that would be the best way for everything you want, none of them feared the Clintons, believe me, especially people like Comey, uh, Brennan, and Clapper. Uh, th they don't. And, and, and the Clintons are evil incarnate, without any question. But, but, but the issue of what they're responsible for with regard to all these deaths, I think, is basically a big waste of time. I think life sometimes gets very complicated. People die. There are strange things that happen to a lot of people. I mean, clearly Vince Foster committed suicide. He wasn't killed by anybody. I've done a major study of that. The Park Police aren't the greatest police force in the world, but they did a nice job on that when they were helped by the FBI. Don't worry about that stuff. That's, that's chicken feed compared to where we're going. We're talking about a constitutional coup that occurred between June of 2016 and, and within the last couple of days. But let me also emphasize something. People need to, if you want to, I'm not going to suggest that you go read the opinion by Chief Judge <laughs> Collier of the FISA Court, which was issued on April 26, 2017. It's going to be declassified in its full form so it's readable. It has so many pages, it's 99 pages, and most of them are just black. So trying to read it and figure it out is very difficult. But here's what you need to know about it. You don't need to do anything except this. In that opinion, she says that from the beginning of the administration of Obama, the FBI and the senior Justice Department officials who were responsible for going to the FISA court and certifying that Americans who accidentally got picked up on foreign intercepts, their names were kept out and their conversations were minimized. For a number of years, the Obama administration lied to the FISA court and said that was happening when, in fact, that wasn't happening. What was happening at the FBI and the National Security Agency was that a number of people were taking conversations which were of foreign people but involved Americans and then telephone numbers related to those Americans, and they were sharing that. These contractors illegally took that information, gave it to the Bureau, and to outside individuals. The court actually found that. This is not some guesswork. The court found that it had been lied to for a number of years and that there was what it called an institutional lack of candor by the Obama Justice Department. That is now being investigated by Mr. Durham because what it was was it was senior DOJ people, Yates and a fellow named John Carlin who was in charge of what they call the National Security Division, and they basically lied to the court repeatedly. That, to me, is the single most serious part of this investigation because all of the stuff about spying on Trump started as a result of this illegal spying on ordinary Americans. And why did they do it? They were looking for political dirt on opponents so that it could be used by the Obama people in the next campaign. It started as far back as 2012 in the, in the second administration of Obama. And it happened because the mainstream media would not ever go into any kind of criticism of that administration. For example, at the Justice Department, when the IG got removed 
from looking into the national security section. Nobody said a word. The IG is supposed to have access to every single area in the Justice Department. But strangely enough, at the same time that they were weaponizing our intelligence system, they kept the IG out. And it was perfectly OK with the press. As the Washington Post says, democracy dies in darkness. The, uh, the, the, the decision to uh, tell the Inspector General Horowitz it's the same guy, that he could not investigate and audit the national security op uh, operations of the Justice Department. Just think about this. The single most sensitive area and the one where Americans' rights are most dangerously at risk. Sally Yates, when Harwood said, I want to audit all these functions, the wiretaps, the FISA, everything. She wrote a 55-page memo denying him that right. It, it, it was such an important decision that she wrote 55 pages about why he couldn't look into it. And of course, the reason he couldn't look into it was because she knew what was going on. Now, whether or not somebody like Sally Yates will ever be held accountable legally really doesn't matter to me. I, I hope it she is. It does to me. I know. That's fine. We'll but, but what I want is I want, the, I want the facts on the record of what she did. I want her perfidy to be known to everybody so that it can be excused by the New York Times and the Washington Post as kind of tut-tut stuff. Oh, dear, my dear, why, why are we so concerned about this? They, the, the, the mainstream media is, is no longer journalism. It's advocacy. It's propaganda. I mean, the New York Times is a joke. You saw the way they changed their headline the other day. I mean, they're just, I mean, that, that's pathetic. I mean, Abe Rosenthal is rolling over in his grave watching what I his grandson give, is doing. I want to give an example of, of, yeah. of how this was, and you all know it, you just may not know to hook it up with what Joe was just talking about, Michael Flynn. The conversation he had with the Russian, or conversations he had with the Russian ambassador were leaked to David Ignatius in the Washington Post who wrote about them and, and, and revealed the, whatever was in the conversations. That was a crime. Whoever got that conversation and revealed not only the conversation, but the name of Mike Flynn to Ignatius, who just is he's a type, typist for the Democratic Party, that he, that person committed a crime. And it should be really simple to find out who it was. Of course, Jeff Sessions didn't do anything about it. And, and very cleverly then, this is, this is how this whole system works, very cleverly, near the bottom of the article that he wrote, because he's a columnist, he said, maybe the Logan Act was was uh, violated. I swear to God that he had no idea what the Logan Act was. Whoever leaked it to him fed him that information. And that was the basis then for the FBI to go question Michael Flynn for, that, for the interview. And Sally Yates testified to that and said, oh, well, we thought there might have been a Logan Act violation. That is. The Logan Act says an unauthorized person cannot talk or negotiate with foreign governments. He was the incoming national security advisor. How could he be unauthorized? John Kerry is going off telling all the, the uh, Iranians not to do anything with us because Trump's going to be gone. Now, that is a Logan Act violation, but nobody says that. Question? I think I still remember. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I couldn't stop. Chaz Kirshner, uh, uh, wondering if you could speak uh, to the report's validity with respect to the findings of, of Russian interference with our elections. Well, that's a pretty interesting question because all they did, I mean, the, the Russians tried to interfere in our election. There's no doubt about it. They've been doing that for years. And we've been doing it for years as well. We used to run the Italian elections from the 1940s on to prevent the communists from taking power. We used to give out walk around money to Italians in Lira to prevent the communists from taking power. We did the same thing in France. We did the same thing in Germany. We did the same thing in Spain. We've done it all over the world. When our CIA people are good, they're really good. So interfering, yeah, naturally. So interfering in other people's elections is what intelligence agencies do. Now, what did, now, what's interesting is 51% of the American people believe that the Russians were able to change votes in voting machines. That's BS. They never got near a machine. 
They did penetrate some systems to get voter data, but they never got near voting machines and voting data. This thing about the Russians, and you know, Mueller makes a big deal out of the fact that we discovered that they had some bots that were doing, and they were doing internet buys, and they spent, I don't even know if it was a couple of million bucks, maybe it was less than that. It was less than that, it was a few hundred thousand. Yeah, and to, to buy some internet fake advertising. That's been going on for 50 years. But you see, it, it was important that it be lied about because it was the only thing that allowed the fake narrative about Russian collusion to work. You see, the reason the Russians did it, according to, to the, the crazies, is because they had a deal with Trump that they were gonna help him win. Now, if you think Vladimir Putin, Putin wanted Donald Trump, he wanted Hillary Clinton. She was the one who did the reset button in Moscow with the, with the foreign minister, of course they got it wrong, the word was they put overcharge on the button instead of reset. You remember that? Go ahead, you wanted to say something. <laughs> well, the other night at Paul's I said on the porch, I want to ask you all a question, I want it answered on Friday, and that is, tell me what the Russians did to interfere. And no one can tell. And this interference it just shows how good the Democrats are at talking points. The Republicans don't know how to counter them. The Russian interference, all of a sudden, interference is a crime in and of itself, whatever it is. That's the criminal I mean, word. When the Russians want to interfere, they just kill somebody. <laughs> like they did, like, like they did in, in the UK when they poisoned the guy with the, the plutonium derivative. I mean, that's, that's what the Russians did. I just, I just finished a wonderful uh, spy two novel uh, about uh, Oleg. Gordievsky, who was a spy for MI6. He was a Russian spy, but they brought him over. And, and um, they, they were talking then, it was in the 80s, about how the Russians were planning to thwart Maggie Thatcher's reelection. And they worked hard on it because they wanted the Labor Party person to win. I mean, this has been going on forever and a day. You know, it's, it's just sort of fascinating to see how a narrative like this gets played when there's no legitimate media to push back and say things like, this has been going on for 50 years, and we do it. We're very good at Obama it. Obama in the Israeli election. Yeah. He didn't want Bibi. Yeah, you know, Obama sent people and money over to try and Taxpayers prevent money. Netanyahu from being elected. I mean, you know, that's fine. He has the authority to do that. But, but the notion that somehow what the Russians were doing, I mean, I, I, I wish the Russians hadn't done it, but if you, you, have to be, you have to be realistic about what happens in the world. We do this overseas, they do it here, it didn't affect anything. And uh, to me, this is part of this really destructive narrative in order to do one thing, and that's to destroy a presidency. Didn't, doesn't Andy have a chapter in his book? We haven't gotten it yet, it's waiting for us at our office, he sent it to us. Um, but doesn't he have a chapter in there that talks about how long the Russians have been interfering in our elections yeah. and how the Democrats? went out and asked them to help, spe uh, specifically Ted Kennedy. Now, it's, it's really important to uh, remember about, uh, about this whole thing. The Steele dossier, which is basically 14, it's, it's unclear, it could be 14, could be 20 memos that Steele, it's a novella, none of it's true. So it's basically 14 to 20, um, I would call it fictional documents that were given to the FBI in order to justify paying him and so that they could have something upon which to base their applications to the FISA court for warrants against Carter Page. The, 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 the fundamental truth of this is, and it, Andy said it well in that introduction that I read to you, Andy McCarthy, this all got started right after the election when uh, Hillary doesn't show up for election night to concede. I mean, that was quite remarkable in and of itself, and a, a, an act of such utter ungraciousness. Uh, nonetheless, that night, as they realized, they started thinking about a narrative to explain it, because it couldn't be her fault. It had to be some third force. And that thus was born the Russian narrative. And they started the very next day. There's been several books written about this. There was a very famous book, the name of which I cannot remember, which, where they, they followed the Hillary campaign around. There were two people. There was were, glass, glass ceiling, not chattering the glass or unchattering. Whatever it is, it's glass I read ceiling. it. It's a great it's book. It's in the last chapter. And, and what it is is it was a book that was designed to make her look great and to talk about how great she was, and the book ended up being a disastrous commentary on how poorly her campaign was run. But most importantly, 
there is an entire section on how they develop this narrative about the Russians interfering and causing her loss. You, you should really read that. And Andy does a great job of talking about it uh, in his book. Okay. Next question from somebody, anybody. Shattered, wait a minute. Shattered, inside Hillary Clinton's doomed campaign. Shattered, that's all you need to look up. <laughs> question? Question. Okay, I'm Leif Amott, formerly with the CIA. Some people don't know that, but that's the okay. case. Um, last year, in answer to a question, you said that there were something like nine different judges. Yes, go ahead. Something like nine different judges on the FISA court that held court at different times. Right. Is there any evidence or any suggestion that the, the Comey administration went back to the same judge no. each time? No, they can't. They so can't do that. that so they several can't. different ones actually confirmed or there, there were There were several judges involved in the process. One of them is actually a friend of ours from upstate New York. Uh, Fred Scully, uh, who was a U.S. attorney when, when we were in the Justice Department. No, I, I, we, we actually think that um, because of the lying in the, in the documents that, and because of the failure to provide the, the FISA court with the exculpatory information, which of course would have prevented the warrants from being issued because it would have undercut their uh, validity. You, at, at the top of the warrant application, there is in huge letters the word verified, which means that the, it's a, it's that the FBI has verified every single fact that is in the document that the judges are going to read. I'm, I'm not going to blame the judges for signing the warrant applications. I am going to blame them if, after all of this came out, they didn't do anything about it. Our guess is that the judges did do something about it, but that we don't know that. But we are going to find out because the FISA court has been spoken to by John Durham. And he's spoken to all the judges involved in the FISA process. Because what is, what is absolutely clear, because here's what happened. They went to get a FISA warrant on Carter Page without the dossier, and they were denied because they didn't have enough information about it. When they got the Steele dossier started, they went back and then they got the original and three extensions based on the dossier. So there is no doubt that what they presented to the court was A, false, and B, designed to get the result they wanted, not designed to do the right thing for the American people. You know, it's, over, it's overwhelming. We know so much because we read everything all the time about this and we, and we write about it. But one, one extra fact about that that's really important. Joe talked about the, the, the uh, Judge Collier's opinion that told, talked about that the, they were illegally allowing contractors to get this national security information. When Mike Rogers, Admiral Mike Rogers, who was head of the NSA, discovered all of this and took, took it to the court. At the same time, he discovered about these contractors having access to information that they were not supposed to have access to. That was in April of 2016. He cut off all those contractors. You no longer get the information. Yeah. And that's when the Obama administration started pursuing the FISA uh, authorizations on, on Carter Page and people in the Trump, the, just at that moment. The, the important thing to remember oh, about- Can I tell one thing? Yeah, That's when they hired Glenn Simpson. That's when they hired Fusion GPS in April of twenty. When they cut off, when, when Judge Collier on the FISA court found out as a result of Admiral Rogers, the head of NSA, telling her there have been these massive violations going on for years, she stopped all the contractors from getting information she, she shut down a whole section of electronic interception for a period of time until she could be sure that it was being done by the law. This, we, you, ha you have to sort of just keep in your mind, this is really important. All of the villains in this story are lawyers. <laughs> or senior politicians. The one hero, and now, before I get to the one hero, ask yourself this question. This goes on from 2012 to 2017, when the president takes office. That's five years. Not a single FBI agent, 
Not a single CIA officer, not a single Department of Justice career lawyer ever objected to anything that was being done. Now, this is the vaunted career civil servant corps that we are supposed to genuflect in front of. All of those people, almost to a person, all of them were lawyers and did nothing. Or most law, or law most FBI agents are lawyers, either that or CPAs. That's one of the things that the, that the FBI requires. Now, you say to yourself, these are supposed to be the best. When you don't have a single whistleblower over a five-year period for extensive illegal activity in this area, you've got an institutional problem. And that, and that comes from the top. The reason those people didn't want to complain was because they feared if they did, they would lose their job. They knew their masters. They knew Sally Yates. They, know Jim, Jim, they knew Jim Comey. They, know, they knew James Brennan. Uh, B B Brennan. They, they knew Clapper. Uh, John Brennan, excuse me. Now, my, Admiral Mike Rogers was the head of NSA. He's the one who, on his own, as a result, uh, it's, a, it's a great story. He's sitting in his office one day, and this little guy walks in who's a compliance officer, and he says, you know, Admiral, there's a lot of anomalies in some of this data that we're seeing. It's called 702 data, just so it's a number of a statute, and it's a type of information that you're allowed to access under rare circumstances. He says, this, is, this doesn't look right. So he, and the, and the Admiral says, okay, conduct an audit. Guy comes back a week later, he says, it's really bad. We need to do a complete shutdown of it. So he orders a complete audit, <coughs> they get it done. As soon as he finds out what's been going on, that there's been illegal activity, all these contractors have been doing things they shouldn't, he doesn't go to the Justice Department. He goes to the FISA court. He goes to Judge Collier and meets with her and says, this is what I found. She then holds, uh, schedules a hearing that's how the Justice Department finds out about his activities, Admiral Rogers. At that point, a name you never hear in this scandal, Ash Carter, who was the Secretary of Defense at the time, gets together with James Clapper and they go to the President and they say, we've got to fire Admiral Rogers. Now, why would you fire Admiral Rogers for exposing illegal activity? And you know what, the President, we, are t we, we don't know what actually was said, but my guess is Obama, his pretty smart cookie, said, it's too late. You fire him now and you're dead meat. Because Rogers was a widely respected military officer and he was a god at the NSA and on Capitol Hill. He was widely regarded as the one person in the administration that you could count on to tell the truth. And in fact, remember when they did that intelligence assessment in between the election uh, and, and, and the inauguration where they tried to analyze Russian influence on the campaign? The CIA, and they said 17 agencies supported it. That was BS. The, the global mapping? It was only three agencies. Agency. It was only three agencies that commented on it. CIA, no, let's see. CIA, C FBI, and NSA. NSA, but, but then OD, uh, and, and the ODNI. And the bottom line was this. Admiral Rogers was the only one who said, it's an interesting theory, I give it modified, I, you know, I don't agree with this conclusion, but I'll, you know, I give it modified support. But and, this and who was running the FBI? Comey. And who was running the CIA? Brennan. Oh, the two co-conspirators. Question. <clears throat> I'm one of the uh, delusional people that you referred to in the opening of your... That's okay, conference. you're entitled. It's a great country. Thank you. Uh, you bet. And there's one thing before I make my point. Uh, I saw Putin on television. Now, maybe it was a fake television, but I saw him Speaking on of television. He was asked if he supported Trump for the, to be elected, and he said yes. So that's different from what you're saying. Collusion right there. There it is. <laughs> Who can we indict? No, no. I'm, I'm saying... You don't understand foreign policy and diplomacy? Wait, wait a minute, ma'am. Wait a minute. Elected? I'm asking the question. Excuse well, then me. ask it. I'm going to. Okay, let's have it. And it's not a question. It's a suggestion. Next year, if you have these folks back, and they're, they're very uh, capable proponents from their point of view, I agree with that for sure, uh, have someone else with 
a different point of view. Oh, like they do in Chautauqua every no, day no, on that stage. Hey, you know what? That's I love it. I mean, what I'm saying. Let, me, no. let me just tell you something. No, we no, went, let, we, me, let me just finish. <laughs> that amphitheater's filled with them for nine months. Let, let me just finish. Let me finish. No, please. No, I, please. I, don't, I don't disagree if, there, if politics is going to be discussed in this manner here. Openly, because I know this many is not I was discussing well, 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 law. I was discussing I'm, the law, not politics. I'm I not a politician. I understand that it's important to have different points of view. I'm for that. Okay. And you have a point of view, and I'm, I'm, it's fine with me to have it presented. But the other people who speak here, who are, I'll agree, mostly liberal, <laughs> are cautioned not to be, not to be extremely. Uh, partisan in their presentations. Oh, I so, see. So, I, so I that, noticed that. So that's okay. That's listen. So, fair, so I would say fair, fair point. What is your question? I, well, because I'm other finished. people are standing that's, back there and they well, want to I ask would, a question. I'm finished. That's my I point. You, you, I, I think it's a good point. Thank you very much for making it. Uh, we're happy to have other people debate us in any form at any time on, on that this stage. Yeah. Maybe they'll invite us on this big stage. <laughs> By the way, here's the thing about that. that. What we're discussing is the law and the facts. It just so happens that Hillary Clinton is a Democrat and Donald Trump is a Republican. Now, in discussing all of this, you can't possibly avoid saying the word Democrat and Republican. You can't possibly avoid identifying people by their party. And when you look at the facts and you get into it, it is a fact. It is a fact that this started as a result of her campaign. Now, that's not a political issue. It just so happens that she's a Democrat, and she lost, and she was mad, and they had to figure out a way to figure out to explain why she lost. I understand that. But that's not political. That's fact and law enforcement. Yeah, I listen to MSDNC, and I hear Carl Bernstein uh, talk about <laughs> Trump administration doing something as severe as Watergate. And you keep hearing Watergate from MSDNC, but I don't think they understand what's really going on with all the corruption that you've just talked about. Given that we have a generation of millennials who really don't understand Watergate, how severe is this current situation that you've described in comparison to Watergate? It's much worse, and here's why. The mainstream media is ignoring it. And in Watergate, the mainstream media went after it, and that's what re really frightens me. The, um, the truth is, is that the mainstream media made up its mind uh, that it wanted Hillary Clinton to be president. She was their candidate, and they didn't want him to win. And they, they, their coverage was designed to defeat him during the campaign. I think anyone who's reasonable will look at that. Uh, and, and, and agree to that, and they, they really, and I must say, he helped them a lot because of, the, because of the kind of person he is who's not a politician, and he said what he thought. Now, when he won, um, they were appalled uh, because, A, they really loved Hillary and they thought it was her time. The, the, the other thing about it is, is that that would have been one thing. And you will recall, interestingly enough, that right after that, the New York Times, this is really bad, went out of its way to say they had a front page letter from the publisher. This is unbelievable, saying, we're very concerned about our coverage. We think we let you down. We need to reevaluate what we're doing. Now, that was, I said, wow, that's really amazing. And then as the Trump administration went on, they reverted to form to the campaign coverage, and of course now it's all at war. I mean, it's just. We have a question. Yeah. A question, projection. How exposed uh, is Obama and the Obama administration upper echelon? When you say exposed, you mean criminally? Yes. yes. Well, the, the, the answer is not, not very much, and the reason is very simple. I think it's very dangerous to criminally investigate former Presidents. I think it's ridiculous. I think it's dangerous. I think it's a classic banana republic activity. Uh, and I, I would oppose any effort to indict President Obama because I don't think it would be good for the country. I, I feel the same way about Donald Trump if he had done anything wrong, but mm -hmm. thus far there's no evidence that he has. However, 
What I would favor, and what I think must happen, is that there must be a full accounting of everything that went on and what President Obama knew, when he knew it, mm -hmm. what he authorized. The Susan Rice email on January 20th, just think about this, she's writing that email as Donald Trump is being sworn in. I mean, it's, it's, you can't make that up. If somebody put that in a book, they'd laugh at you. But it happened. But, that, but, and that memo is the key to unraveling the role of President Obama and the Vice President. And you know what? There's just no doubt that they knew what was going on. They were getting regular briefings. So all of that stuff has to be examined. And I'm sure it will be. I'm sure John Durham's into all of that. I have no such compunction, though, about Joe Biden. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I know, I know a lot about Ukraine, and I know how he hid uh, Hunter Biden's uh, criminality by getting the, the prosecutor general there fired, or he was going to withhold a right. $1 billion right. loan guarantee. So there's other stuff going on there. And, and thank you for your presentation. We needed that. <laughs> Is there any more questions? Yeah, we'll oh, here he comes. Here. Oh, they're lined up. Look at them. Let's, uh, uh, let's assume that the um, <clears throat> transgressions that you've uh, brought to light and the uh, indictments uh, that you uh, talk about might come to light, and let's say they happen. Do you think the uh, uh, American electorate will uh, view that as sort of old news and uh, when it comes to uh, the coming election, not really play much of a role because uh, it might be viewed as interesting, but old news. Well, I think that, that could happen. Uh, the American people have a limited attention span uh, because they're trying to live their lives and make a living. And thank goodness under Trump, they're making a pretty good living. Uh, but, but the issue is, politically, what do they care about? Um, it may very well be a nothing, but here's what matters. For those of us that have been in federal law enforcement and who have wielded the vast power of the federal grand jury and the indictment, we appreciate why it's important to have people of honor and integrity. Uh, it's why I oppose an indictment of President Obama if it were found that he had violated the law. There's no evidence that he's done anything illegal. I, I think at, right now there's a lot of bad judgment by President Obama and Biden. Brennan and Clapper are a different level of, of of analysis criminally. I, I, I have no doubt in my mind that John Brennan started a criminal conspiracy in order to get Donald Trump. There's just no doubt about that. I, I do not attribute that to President Obama, although he was aware of what was going on. Now, I think the American people don't like this kind of stuff. They want to know the truth. They want to get on. You know, who knows what kind of it effect, but it doesn't matter. To me, that's irrelevant. I don't care what effect it has on the electorate. We got to get these answers. Well, I care, I, I care for this reason. I do think that the Russian investigation, which had not reached a conclusion uh, in 2018, affected the the congressional elections. Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, that what that is that is a very important point. One of the things that was the design of this plot was to not only defeat Donald Trump, but to take back the House and the Senate. That was part of a scheme. That's why Harry Reid got so deeply involved in the dossier. Uh, that's why when James Comey briefed the Gang of Eight, which are the senior people in the House and the Senate who get special briefings on intelligence, he didn't brief Republicans. Comey didn't brief Republicans. He only briefed Democrats about the, some of the key we have details. Another, we have three more questions. Go ahead. So let's, yep. First of all, thank you for your presentation. You are the other side in Chautauqua. <laughs> <laughs> Last question. Do you have a sense of what timetable this current investigation is on? As soon as it's possible for these people to do it. Bill Barr is just determined to do it professionally. And he's not going to just whip out some indictment to right. make people feel good, like um, uh, the Mueller investigation did with Papadopoulos and uh, Mike <laughs> Flynn and um, uh, Roger Stone. Let me just say that, apropos of what Victoria just said, the indictment of Michael Flynn and George Papadopoulos was a, both were disgraceful acts of prosecutorial misconduct. I think Bob Mueller should be disbarred as a result of those decisions. I think Andrew Weissman, who was the eminence, grease, and the evil 
uh, person behind the throat should be disbarred. I we have two more cases with Andrew Wiseman being uh, of gross misconduct. I think that they both should be disbarred. I think what they did was unconstitutional. I think it was a disgrace to federal law enforcement. And when you watched Bob Mueller at that little news conference that he held where he announced his reaction to Bill Barr's letter and he could barely walk up the steps and then he, he didn't take any questions and now we know why when we watched him at the hearing, he couldn't answer any questions. As, as someone said, um, I assumed for this that he didn't write the report, but for God's sakes, I thought he'd at least read it. That's, that was Lou Dobbs. We have to give Lou credit. Give Lou Dobbs we, credit. We were doing his show. <laughs> he said, said it. We have we some have, more questions. We have technically five minutes to go. So the questions have Okay, let's get up here and get a mast. And then we'll. So the question has to do with Russian interference in the election in the mode of the uh, U.S. intelligence agencies helping to keep helping to keep Italy and France from going communist. Uh -huh. What do you think the Russians did in terms of their uh, work to uh, help the country become more, uh, more partisan, country? more separated? Which did country? the Russians do You mean what did the Russians do to make the United States yes. get mad at each other and have yes, a big a fight? exactly. Well, they worked with Hillary Clinton and they, did they accomplished a great goal. They got an investigation of a sitting president going, and it created a civil war that we're now engaged They've in. They've hampered I'd, I'd say the Russians did a pretty good job of disinformation because everything they fed, Christopher Steele, got into a, a warrant applications in an American court. That's Russian disinformation. I give the Russians an A-plus for disruption. That's what they did. They had, uh, uh, as J. Edgar Hoover used to say, they had useful idiots at the FBI working for them. Hi, I'm Nancy Langston from Pittsburgh. My question is, when these people are indicted, what kind of sentence will they get? Where will they go? And who oh will God. sentence them? Well, don't, don't assume anybody's going to be indicted, number one. Don't assume anybody's going to be convicted, number two. Because these are strange, th these are strange times. I, I, I just think this. He, that's why I say, don't put all your eggs in the indictment basket. What matters is disclosure and information. Now, in my mind, there's no doubt that John Brennan was the head of a criminal conspiracy. I very much, for the good of our government and the intelligence community, think he should be indicted. I don't know that he ever will, and, but I do know this. I think John Durham is such a professional that he will never bring a case that he doesn't believe there's guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. That's all we can ask. All we want are good judgments being made because we know that for eight years there were no good judgments being made under Obama about law enforcement. They politi politicized law enforcement to a fair thee well, and in the course of it, they destroyed the FBI and the Department of Justice. Just think about this. There are 26 senior people at the FBI and the Department of Justice who've either been fired, demoted, transferred, or retired. 26 people. And it's in the hierarchy. In the highest levels of the FBI and the department. And remember, Bruce Orr, Bruce Orr is still at the department. Now, we you we know have what, one last question. Yeah, well, I'm going to get to it. I've got to make this point. Bruce Orr's point. Remember what he did. He was a conduit for all the information that went to the information from Steele. Why is he still at the department? He's cooperating. You uh, made the point clear of not uh, indicting former presidents. My question is, what about the actions of former presidents going forward, such as the so-called deep state, and if they are involved in that and and doing criminal activities? I, I don't understand the question. You mean like what, if there's a former president engaged in some sort of criminal activity today, against the Yes, or in the future. I, I think that, first of all, I just don't think that's going to happen. I think most presidents are out there making money, having a grand time, and p politicizing their lives and making tons of money. Uh, I, I, do th I do think this. I think when somebody leaves office like Obama did and a scandal of this magnitude occurs, everything needs to come out about it. That's not going to hurt him. Because, you know, he's a very popular president now, and, and people already know about all this stuff. They don't know his role yet. Maybe that'll change once they know his role, but we'll see. We thank them very much.
And to speak to the gentleman's question here about having a debate, we're all for that. Let's go to that big room across the way and have a debate. Perfect. I agree with him. Thank you very much. I hope to see you next week. Bring your uh, dancing shoes for the jazz picture thing, okay?